Well, that's uh, good advice along with a lot of other advice that we're hearing and we've got more coming up here in a moment. We know that, uh, of course, in this constantly changing climate, you have questions about the virus and what doctors are working on in terms of treatment and, of course, a vaccine. And you can text, of course, those questions to 763-797-7215. And Dr. Mark Sanis joins us for the second week in a row. He's a disease specialist at Health Partners in St. Louis Park and a father of three and uh, a very busy week. So thank you for making time to come in. We really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. Um, okay, so you were say, we were just talking a little bit about what's gonna happen this week. A lot of people are wondering who is getting tested right now mm -hmm. and when are those results going to come back? Now, it, it's a really good question. And I think early on uh, in all of this, we were hopeful that we could get anyone that had symptoms tested. That changed very quickly when we realized that there is a national shortage of the testing supplies that we need to run the tests. So we had a, a large group of folks that did get tested and that group largely still is waiting for their results from last week. This week we prioritized utilizing the, the Minnesota Department of Health to get our hospitalized patients and our sick healthcare workers tested. Uh, the rationale being we need to know for our healthcare workers whether they can return to work or what we need to do uh, in order to get them, you know, to be able to return to work as soon as possible. Likewise, with our hospitalized patients, it affects our use of the personal protective equipment that we're using in the hospital. We need to know whether that individual has COVID-19 or not so that we can use that judiciously. And you said expect a spike this week, just expect it. I think you have to assume that will be the case. We have a lot of tests that are essentially backlogged across the state, probably in the low 1,000s, maybe even approaching 2,000 tests that will start to come back. Those results will come back. And if this plays out as we think it will, we're likely going to see what was going on last week is actually a large number of folks with COVID-19 yep. that are already home and better. Uh, we had two cases that came out of hospitalized patients this week. By the time we had their results back, they were already back home. And, That's a good and doing point. Fine. Let's let's keep reminding because we only I think I, I had heard we had four people hospitalized in the state and no deaths so far. Correct. And a large number of folks at this time of year, it's no surprise to see people admitted to the hospital with respiratory illness. Normally, you wouldn't have done anything differently about those. At this time, though, now all of those patients are getting testing Tested. for COVID-19. So okay. we have a number of, of patients that are in. You should expect a number of those will be positive. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had a lot of folks that are critically ill, which I think is the important side of That's this. That's a very good point as well. Um, a, a lot of people asking this question, um, they're asking, what are the chances that the schools will resume after next week and what can we expect thing when can we expect things to get back to normal yeah I, I think the question about starting right after the 25th is a good one in that it's nice to be able to plan and i think that's the one that i'm, I'm getting most commonly i have been telling folks plan is if we're going beyond the 25th and adjust uh if if it turns out that we can come out of the uh, social distancing sort of stance at that point great but i think you have to expect that this could go longer yeah, I'm really thinking it's going to as well, at least another week past that at, at the least. Um, this question is about kids. There's been a lot of talk and advice um, about keeping young kids home, but teenagers are having a really t a tough time. When, when can they see their friends? I would say follow the, the, what our health department officials and the governor have said this week. This needs to be socially distanced. And if they can do this via the devices that they're using and via the telephone, I would encourage you to do so. This is not the time for play dates or get togethers while no. folks are home from school. I know, very difficult, but true. How long can the virus stay on surfaces and what can you use to kill the virus on different surfaces? Um, are there special detergents for dishes and clothes? And what are those best household cleaning products out there? Question that's been coming up really from the beginning on this one. What, what can you do kind of locally? And I think, remember, this is a, a virus that's spread through respiratory droplets. Uh, so you get this by being in close proximity to somebody that coughs or sneezes on you or by touching something that they have coughed or sneezed on. We think that the virus probably survives on surfaces. There was an article that came out this week in the medical literature looking at survival on plastic and metal and probably as long as 72 hours uh, on those surfaces. So using the conventional cleaning things like Clorox, Lysol, these products that we have in our houses already, those wipes that people are, are using work, I think, to get rid of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. We knew they were good for the common cold virus. I think there's increasing data that they're probably good for taking care of this as well. And I also heard that once you spray, let's say you use not a wipe, but a spray, let it air dry. Don't wipe it, like let it air dry 
and don't, you know what I mean? Just like, and then yeah. that's, that's something that I've heard as well. Um, I haven't heard this question yet. Can mosquito bites transmit the virus? Yeah, and I think uh, there's a lot of sort of false information out there. This is not a virus that's transmitted through mosquitoes. So okay, things good. that we see in the summertime like West Nile virus, that's different. This is something that's respiratory droplets and that's the primary mechanism. And, and uh, also, I think we should note that let's say you have someone in your house that is coughing and, and is, this is not a time to go to the doctor. You need to call. You need, don't just show up, right. call, right. right? Absolutely. And in fact, uh, remind folks, this is something where the vast majority of people, if you, so first of all, not everybody is gonna get this. Right. I think that's one of the common things. Secondly, of those that get it, 80% will get better and not need to seek care. At home. Right, at home, and they should stay home to make sure that we have capacity to see the patients that do need to be seen in our urgent cares and emergency centers. Of that remaining 20%, two-thirds may require hospitalization or some higher level of care. 5% re will require critical care. Everything we're doing right now is to basically decrease the total number of folks that get yep. sick so, we have room so that we hospitals. have room for that 5%. Yeah. And, you know, this concept of flattening the curve has been out in the media this week, and it's an epidemiologic phenomenon. If you can reduce the number of people that get infected in the first place, we can handle as a healthcare system at full capacity all of those that are going to need the real high-level critical care. That's the importance of what we're doing right now. Goal. All right. Well, listen, we really appreciate you coming in this morning. You're going to go back to the computer, answer more questions. Uh, Dr. Santis, thank you so much. Thanks, and uh, we're going to head into the kitchen. Bobby's actually going to do some cooking for us. We're looking forward.